2009 and continued to work with the Secretariat till 2015. Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, webinar uh, uh, um, uh, today. It's very timely uh, uh, right now to discuss the role of WHO, uh, especially at the time of pandemic of COVID-19 uh, uh, and uh, seek ways to uh, have WHO that can meet our uh, uh, needs and our uh, uh, wishes. I will not make uh, more much time uh, just to uh, let you know that the webinar would be in English, but we have interpretation um, available in uh, four uh, 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 languages. And you will find at the bottom of your screen um, uh, uh, icon for interpretation and you can choose uh, your language. We have uh, Spanish, we have uh, uh, French, we have Arabic, which will be the Korean on uh, uh, the screen, and Hindi will be uh, Chinese. So we will have uh, the uh, question and answers. Uh, this will be for all participants to share uh, questions, to ask to uh, um, our speakers, but also to share ideas, to make comments, and maybe uh, to share resources or uh, websites. So please use that. The chat will not be available, so uh, uh, don't use the chat, but uh, the questions and the answers will be available for everybody, and uh, uh, you can share whatever uh, uh, you want on it. Uh, Unfortunately, we will not be able to open uh, the audio for all participants, uh, so we will use uh, uh, the uh, uh, questions and answers for the interactions between participants, speakers, and between participants and participants. We'll start with um, our first uh, uh, speaker. We have three speakers. Each of them will talk from uh, 10 to 12, 15 minutes, something around that. And then we will open the uh, uh, discussion around your questions and uh, uh, answers. Please post as many questions as uh, uh, you want, uh, but allow us to uh, categorize the questions if needed. So we may not relate each question to a certain uh, participant because we're collecting questions in different languages. Uh, so uh, forgive us for that from uh, the beginning. Um, just to ask the uh, interpreters if um, if my voice and tone is clear, if I need to be slower. Yes, you are audible. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Mirza Alas, and she will address us on the role of WHO in global health governance. Mirza is uh, a program officer at the South, uh, South Center in Geneva, Switzerland. She works on um, global health, global public health issues as a part of health intellectual property and biodiversity uh, program team. She joined the South Center in 2015 to provide research and policy advice to developing countries on antimicrobial resistance and access to medicine issues at the United Nations, World Health Organizations, and the Food and Agriculture Organization. She also works in developing technical capacity on um, antimicrobial resistance and access to medicine issues at the regional and the national level. Previous to uh, joining the South Center, she worked as a health policy researcher with Third World Network and had been actively engaged in the United Nations processes in New York related to sustainable development uh, uh, goals. Uh, just before I uh, give the floor to uh, uh, Mirza, um, just I was asked by the interpreters not to use uh, abbreviations or acronyms. 
So uh, this is for all speakers. So uh, Mirza, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Hani. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. It is uh, a pleasure for me to be able to, to be part of this very important webinar. I also have quite a bit of a difficult job because I am, have to cover um, an extensive topic in a very short time, but I will try um, my best um, to do so. So just to, um, to say for the people who might be joining us who never heard of the South Center, this is a small intergovernmental organization that is based in Geneva. And it basically works as a think tank for developing countries and it covers broad areas. So one of the main areas we work on is in, on health policy issues, but also the center works on issues around climate change, development, trade, um, and many others. Um, and we have 53 member states um, that are across the world from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So um, I'm going to try really briefly to cover some of the issues related to the role of WHO in global health governance. So before I go there, I think that given that we are all experiencing this COVID-19 pandem pandemic, um, maybe we should, you know, go back a little bit in history to what um, we have as a precedent of, of what we are experiencing today. And I think since we are all kind of new to this, to this uh, pandemic experience, I, I thought appropriate to maybe look back a little bit on um, the, flu, the Spanish flu or the flu pandemic in 1918 um, as, a, as a precedent that could help us um, understand what we're living today, but also the role of WHO. So what was the world like in 1918? So first, there was no global health agency that coordinated any response. There were many countries that actually did not even have ministries of health. Um, the world was coming out of, of the First World War. There was limited scientific and technological information. And also the tools we had um, to deal with a pandemic actually look quite similar to what we are currently using. So social distancing, um, masks, closing of schools. Um, and this picture that I'm using here um, is actually taken from, from California. And if you can see, then it has this, um, this um, sign about wearing mask or go to jail. So with that as a background, we have to um, then move to, to what was the world like pre-WHO. So in the 1800s, uh, the trade and travel with the East led to outbreaks and cholera and other epidemic diseases in Europe. So there was an incentive for European countries to, to collaborate with other countries to find out, to figure out how they could um, uh, deal with this situation. So in, the in 1851, the first international sanitary conference took place in Paris. And this was followed by 1892, where there were two conventions that had to do with the control of infectious diseases, such as cholera, and later, five years later, the control of plague. Another interesting thing that, that came from this was the standardized quarantine procedures for cholera and yellow fever. So as we moved um, in history, it was not until 1948 that actually the World Health Organization was uh, established. And, and it, it came into force right after the Second World War. And the main responsibility really at that time was the classification of disease. Um, in, in fact, the first World Health Assembly in 1948 established the priorities of the organizations being um, basically looking after mostly infectious diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, um, venereal diseases, but also looking at issues of maternal and child health and sanitary engineering. And as the time has passed, the organization has expanded its mandate and expanded its scope. So an exam as an example, in the 1950s, for instance, it started providing guidance on the use of antibiotics. And in 1969, the first international health regulation kind of came into being. And this also looked at um, the control of particularly six, inf six infection diseases. And as we will see later, why um, the International Health Regulations Code have been modified 
and have been um, an important um, international instrument. So, but the WHO mandate was really supposed to be much broader than these previous um, sanitary conventions that we had before. So as, as you can see, um, from this quote that I have um, put here from an article in The Guardian recently, it says the WHO was born during a, mo a moment of hopeful internationalism that followed the ca chaos of the Second World War. So this idea of, of a global collaboration in fighting diseases was not new because as we've seen, there was precedence already on a pandemic, but also on the control of these infectious diseases that couldn't be done by one country alone. But the role of the WHO was supposed to be bigger than this. Um, so in the constitution of the WHO, the main goal is the attainment by all people of the highest possible level of health. And, and its primary role is to coordinate, direct and coordinate international health within the United Nations systems. Today, the main areas of work have expanded. So, head through the life course, non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, preparedness, surveillance, response, emergency. These are all part of the areas that WHO works on today, which as you can see, have expanded um, a lot from when it was first ambition, looking at just this role for infectious diseases. In terms of the WHO governance structure, um, it has basically two main levels. The main level is the World Health Assembly, which is the representative that is where the delegations of the 192 member states are represented. And this is where they take the decisions that are usually reached by consensus. And, um, and this is what it provides guidance in terms of what the Secretariat has to, um, has to do. Then there is the executive board, which is um, a smaller kind of setup with 34 individuals that actually represent member states and their representation is rotated across the regions. And the board is the one that actually kind of first looks at the health issues and provides the recommendations that go forward to the World Health Assembly to other, um, approve resolutions and decisions. Um, the executive director currently is Dr. Tedros um, at Hanuman Jebreus, who actually was the first, is the first DG that has actually been elected by all member states. Before this, what used to happen was that the executive board would be the one uh, looking at the candidates, the executive board would vote, and then they would um, recommend the candidate uh, to the World Health Assembly. Uh, but in this, um, for, this, for the first time in WHO, this was modified and all member states could vote at the WHA. And this is how um, Dr. Tedros was um, elected. And you might have seen it now because he's done, doing the daily briefings uh, for COVID. So why is it that um, the role of WHO is important? And here, um, I think this is a really big question, but I'll try to maybe use some examples to help us um, guide um, this, this, this question. So first, um, I would like to, to mention that within the, the constitution of the WHO, there is this, the existence of this article called Article 19 that basically provides the WHO the ability to adopt uh, conventions or agreements with respect to any matter with the competence of the organization. And this is perhaps the only uh, binding uh, power that the WHO has. The other um, codes and, and legal instruments that exist uh, within the WHO, a lot of them are volunteer, voluntarily and, and voluntary basis. Um, however, the Article 19 has only been used once and is it was to to approve the Tobacco Convention that entered into force on the 27th of February of 2005. Uh, other um, important issues that or normative work um, of WHO that I would like to highlight is the international health regulations. Um, uh, Professor Andrew will be speaking more on this, so I will not um, provide more details yeah. now. Then there are so, the
इसके अलावा दवाइयों और उनके उनसे संबंधित जो पेटेंट है كل ما يتعلق بمشاكل الصحة العالمية وبالذات مسألة قدرة الناس And then I would like to also highlight highlight this um, this particular framework. It's called the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, um, and this is an instrument that is um, actually also a binding instrument with the WHO that was negotiated by all member states. So just maybe here to say, well, why um, highlighting this this instrument? Because I think it's particularly interesting now in the context of COVID-19 and what we are seeing issues around who will be able to get access to treatments, who will be able to, uh, to get access to vaccines if they exist. In this particular framework, the PID framework, the story um, is quite interesting actually. What happened was um, that countries were sharing samples of flu viruses or influenza viruses with uh, WHO coordinated uh, laboratories. And um, in 2007, um, Indonesia basically said that they didn't want to share viruses anymore because what had happened is um, they had shared um, a sample of a virus that was actually, that became um, a, um, a strain that, that needed a vaccine and companies developed this vaccine And when Indonesia went to try to get access to the vaccine because they, um, they were suffering from this um, an outbreak in their country, they couldn't get it at an affordable price. They were offered a price of around $20 per vaccine. And in their case, they were looking at having to vaccinate their whole population, which at that, at that price was impossible for them to do. So they, they were, Um, not happy with this arrangement. They felt like, well, they were sharing the viruses and so were other countries, countries and yet they were not getting any access to um, any benefits from this. So in 2007, uh, member states led by Indonesia, Indonesia really adopted this resolution linking access to vaccine and other benefits. And from this, a negotiation process started that ended with this PIP framework being adopted in 2011. What is particularly important of this is the fact that, that you, have, you have this link being established. The sharing of influenza viruses linked to access to vaccines and sharing of benefits. And in fact, this framework also has a component in which companies have to provide money to the WHO to help run Um, some of the labs, as well as provide some of the benefits include putting aside certain percentage of, of the vaccines so that WHO can distribute. And really the idea behind was that in case of an emergency where you needed to provide vaccines to a country that was suffering from outbreak, that you will be able to do so without having this concern about, um, you know, some countries like stockpiling them or doing you know, uh, arrangements with companies and not being able to access. And I think this is something that is a good lesson as we get, as we get closer to a, vac to a vaccine. Um, but the role of the WHO has not been without challenges. It's the fact that the landscape of global health governments has changed a lot from the moment it was first um, came into being after World War II to a world today that has moved um, away for, from this more needed global solidarity and international cooperation. And even though we have seen in the past the need for precisely this cooperation, it looks like today countries might not be as, as willing um, to, to participate. There are also issues of the fact that there are many other actors that are also 
doing things around global health governance. So WHO is not the single actor. And in many cases, as I point out here, some member states might have different priorities or issues that they might want to see not being um, the purview of, of WHO. There is also issues about funding. Um, and I think the, the other panelists will, will touch on this as well. And the overall weakening of support for multilateral and UN organizations that we have seen in the last years. So I think I, I am going to close with that. Thank you very much. And I'll pass it back to, to the moderator. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mirza, for uh, uh, the, the great presentation. Uh, so uh, please, for everybody, uh, all our participants, please uh, uh, keep posting your uh, uh, questions um, on the questions and answers. And after the three speakers, we will um, come back to uh, uh, your questions. So please keep uh, posting. I, we are aware that we have received some uh, questions already uh, uh, for Mercy. Um, our second speaker will be um, Andrew um, Hammer, and he will talk to us uh, about the uh, handhold and uh, chokehold uh, WHO's uh, um, uh, role in the context of COVID-19. Yeah. Um, Andrew is a senior lecturer in global health uh, policy at the Center uh, for Global Health, uh, Global Public Health, Queen uh, Mary University in uh, uh, London. And here on the screen, you can see uh, the rest of the introduction of um, Andrew. And at the end, Andrew offered um, his uh, uh, website, so um, his keen uh, blogger and uh, uh, Twitter. And uh, uh, these are um, his uh, information. So please uh, follow him um, if, if you want. Um, Andrew, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, great. Thanks, Hani. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's uh, great to be able to join you. Um, this is my, this is my first uh, public webinar, so I'm very excited to be uh, to be part of to be part of this. Um, uh, like Mertza, I've been asked to cover um, quite a broad range of issues. Um, I'm not going to give you any slides. Um, I'm just going to, to talk, talk at you, um, and hopefully some some questions will uh, will come up, and maybe we can talk about them later. Um, so, um, I think what I'm going to say really is I'm just going to make a few reflections about COVID, COVID nineteen, and um, uh, what's going on. Um, then I'm going to say something about um the handhold of the title because i think people really want to know what the relationship is between member states um and the world health organization um i think this is um this is a topic that, that comes up a lot in discussion um i think it's quite important for us to understand the international health regulations um uh, because that's also um an issue that seems to be um coming up in, in discussions around COVID-19. Um, and then finally, I'm going to just talk about the, the chokehold of the title. And, and really, I think I'll just say something about the, um, the funding of the WHO um, and, and what that means for the organization uh, going forward. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to attempt to cover that in, in 12 minutes um, without hesitation, repetition or deviation. Um, <laughs> whether I'll be able to do it remains to be seen, but let's go for it. Um, okay, so uh, just in terms of general reflections, I think there are um, a few to make. And one is that there's a narrative that runs through uh, most discussions around the World Health Organization. And that seems to be a narrative between um, social medicine and bio, biomedicine and a, a technological approach to, to health, where Social medicine is speaking to um, principles of equity, uh, justice, um, solidarity, um, and, and fairness, and, and health as a, as, as a human right. Um, and in distinction to that, there's an idea of 
of health as um, as something which is there to um, to encourage economic productivity and, and provide um, security. And in terms of social medicine, people are very much seen as active participants. Um, and in the more technological and biomedical understanding of health, we're, we're seen as just passive recipients. Um, and I think when you look at um, COVID-19, you can really see the, the two narratives coming together where you have social mobilization um, and very active participants. And at the same time, you have lots of technical interventions which are attempting to um, respond to the pandemic from the top down. Um, so I think it's important to, to bear in mind that th there are those two narratives because they go to the heart of the World Health Organization and why it's controversial and why some member states, notably the United States, find WHO so difficult to stomach. Um, I think the other issue, I think, is, um, is to think about um, COVID-19 in the context of the global economy um, and to understand um, that there is a real push at the moment to try to introduce a new economic order which is very different from the neoliberal order, which we've had to struggle under for the past 30 or 40 years. Um, and I guess in the context, though in the background of COVID-19, there is obviously climate change. Um, and if we are going to uh, go beyond COVID-19 and survive as a, as a, as a species uh, this century and into the next, then we really need to understand the importance of the global economy. Um, and this is something, again, that the World Health Organization has um, been very active in. So if you go back in history um, to the, um, the declaration of Almaraza at the end of the 1970s, uh, which called for a new international economic order. I mean, it's incredible to think that the World Health Organization could be the forum for such an amazing and radical idea. Um, so I think that when we talk about COVID-19, we're we're going back to some of these ideas and some of these um, uh, discussions. Um, and I find that really exciting. Um, okay, so those are just some, some, general, some general reflections. I think generally it's, very, it's, 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 it's really quite early to be making assessments of the World, of the World Health Organization. Um, you know, we're really only at the beginning of the pandemic and there are many countries which are going to have to struggle through it. And um, so we should really see um, what happens in the coming months and probably the coming year too. Um, I think it's I think it's worth um, just thinking a little bit about some of some of the um, some of the global health challenges that the WHO has had to face. Um, I'm going to just touch on two. Um, the first one is the is SARS one. Um, we're having to uh, manage SARS two at the moment, but let's just go back to SARS one. Um, and also uh, the, uh, the 2014 hemorrhagic fever, um, Ebola virus disease. Um, so I think they, they both raise some interesting um, issues which are pertinent uh, today. Um, in the case of SARS, um, so that, that um, first emerged in November 2002. And it wasn't until March the following year that the World Health Organization um, actually got its act together and started to do something about it. Um, but one of the one of the things that really um, comes out of SARS is the is the strength of the World Health Organization, particularly in issuing um, travel advisories. Um, so it was the first time that the World Health Organization said, okay, look at airports, you're going to have to start screening. And we strongly advise people not to travel to areas um, which are infected. Um, this was perceived as being very strong, uh, strong leadership from the, from the World Health Organization. Um, and there was, for the first time, public, public censure um, by Brundtland um, to um, China um, for not revealing the information that it had when it should have done. Um, so again, this is kind of perceived as strong WHO leadership. 
Um, but curiously enough, um, member states said, okay, that's really good. It's really nice to see you do that, but don't do it again. <laughs> because actually um, this is going to damage, this is going to damage our trade. It's going to damage our travel. And we really don't like that very much. Um, so while this was going on in the background, um, there was discussion around the international health regulations. Um, these are a set of um, regulations which govern um, the way that countries and multilateral organizations like the WHO manage pandemics. Um, and they were in the process of being revised when SARS um, hit. Um, and I suppose SARS kind of um, catalyzed those negotiations. And one of the things that came out of the international health regulations in, in 2005, so two years after SARS, um, was um, a set of innovations. Um, one of which, which was to curb the autonomy of the director general of the WHO by introducing an executive, uh, an emergency committee um, that would advise the, the DG on whether or not to declare um, a, uh, a pandemic and and they introduced this idea of the public health emergency of international concern um, but they also made it very clear that states had responsibilities for their health systems and they states were responsible and they had to make sure that their public health system was was fit for purpose um, so we have these international health regulations and it's really important to understand um, that they are there to prevent and protect and provide a public health response, um, but not to the extent that they restrict trade and travel. I mean, that's central to the international health regulations and member states have agreed to that. Um, how am I doing for time? Am I rabbiting on? <laughs> no, I think I'm doing okay. So, um, so that's SARS, um, and, and it's some, there's, there, there's some interesting issues there. Um, uh, now, Ebola. Pehle baar nikla tha to to is tarah ki kuch kuch vichay samne aaye the. As as a, as a failure for the World Health Organization, where it didn't do what it was supposed to do, um, and um, it acted too slowly. Um, it wasn't able to get its act together um, in time, um, and as a consequence. Uh, non-state actors like Médecins Sans Frontières, um, the United Nations um, um, security um, uh, arm of the United Nations had to get involved and um, have um, a United Nations um, uh, security intervention, basically undermining the World Health Organization's role. Um, so this was generally presented as a, as a failure from the World Health Organization. Um, the interesting thing uh, in relation to COVID-19 is that member states um, ignored the international health regulations. They, they, um, um, they imposed the travel restrictions um, and also the World Health Organization didn't do what it was supposed to do. Um, it didn't uh, name and shame um, the, the member states. Um, so, although we have the international health regulations, member states are, are really kind of quite keen uh, to uh, violate them. And uh, the World Health Organization isn't always able to do what it's supposed to do. Um, so I think it's important to, to understand that, I think. Um, but maybe we can come back and talk about that. The really interesting thing about Ebola is that it brought to people's attention uh, a few things about the World Health Organization. One was that it's, um, it was struggling financially. So it had just come out of the financial, um, uh, the global financial crisis. Uh, and it was also facing um, significant cuts from, from its member states, including uh, a cut uh, of 50% to its outbreak and crisis response budget. Um, the World Health Organization was stretched. It was having to manage all kinds of other um, uh, global crises at the same time. Um, and it was having um, some problems with its, its regional structure as well. 
So it kind of, it, it brought to the surface some of the challenges that the World Health Organization was struggling with. One of them was financial. Um, and if I can just end my intervention by talking a little bit about finance, and hopefully I can come back to that um, if there are any questions. But um, the, the most annoying thing that I find when I'm thinking about and listening to, to people talking about the World Health Organization and funding is that we are talking about the tiniest, tiniest amount of money. It's just incredible. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't even have $5 billion to spend over two years. I mean, that's, that's rubbish. <laughs> There's no other word for it. Um, I mean, one of the examples that I give to, to my students, um, just to give you an idea, is that in 2017, I mean, I don't want to pick out one member state, but I'm, you know, let's, let's talk about the United Arab Emirates. Um, it's not exactly a poor uh, member state. Um, and its contribution in 2017 was 24 million dollars. I mean, Jesus, you know, you wouldn't get out of bed for that, would you? And in the same year, in the same year, it spent 10 times that, 240 million dollars, on a Leonardo da Vinci painting. Um, and so it's just tiny, tiny, tiny money that we're talking about, and it's so frustrating. Um, that's my alarm telling me I've gone off um, <laughs> over time, just when I'm getting going. No, I, no okay, I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll cut it short. But um, so, I mean, the comparison is that, I mean, it, it's, it's always hospitals, right? It's always hospitals. They always compare the WHO budget with, with hospital budgets. Um, so if you read this wonderful book uh, by, um, it's the, the World Health Organization. Uh, it's a history. It's great. It's by Marcus Cueto, Theodore Brown, Elizabeth Fee. It's a fantastic book, came out a couple of years ago. I'm reading it at the moment. And they compare the WHO budget with, with Helsinki University Hospital. So in 1990, the two budgets were the same. I mean, 20, 2020, the comparison is the Geneva University Hospital. So that hospital has about the same budget as the World Health Organization. And it has a tiny amount of money, just, just almost unbelievable. Um, and I mean, I, I, I won't talk too much now about assessed contributions and voluntary contributions, but it might come up in, 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 in discussion in a moment. Um, suffice to say that the, the WHO is pretty uh, limited by what it can spend its money on. Most money, 83% uh, of it is, um, is, um, is voluntary and it comes with strings attached. And member states can say, you can have this money, but you have to do it on this or this or this. And the assessed contributions are 18% of, of WHO's budget, which is flexible and it can do what it likes with that money. It's, it's tiny. I mean, it really, so it's very restricted in what it can spend its money on. And there's a whole range of problems about that. Um, so one final point, promise, one final point. Um, the big thing about Trump at the moment is obviously that he's cut, he's frozen funding to the World Health Organization. Um, and that's, you know, a big problem. Um, you know, when you have um, Donald Trump, the, you know, the world's global public bad, um, freezing, freezing its contributions to the World Health Organization, that's a problem. But it's not the first time that the United States has done that. So it froze funding in, in 1985. Um, and that, that was a much bigger problem for the WHO than it is now, because the United States was contributing nearly a quarter of the entire um, assessed contributions to the organization. Um, and the WHO managed to ride that. Uh, in 1998, the United States was in arrears by the tune of nearly $1.3 billion. Um, and it had to take uh, uh, legislation, the threat of the United States losing its vote at the UN uh, to, you know, kick the United States up the ass and get it to start paying its dues. Um, and in 2005 and 2007, the United States again was trying to introduce legislation saying, I'm not going to pay you any money at all unless you start reforming the United Nations. And in 2008, the US was in, arre was in arrears by a billion dollars. So this isn't the first time that it's happened. Um, and the WHO has managed to find ways of managing this. Um, and I, I guess we'll have to wait and see what the United States does next. We don't know whether it's going, we don't know whether it can actually freeze the budget. And we don't know um, whether it's just doing this um, because it wants to try to put pressure on the United Nations and the multilateral system to reform it. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens there, really. Um, 
Okay, so that's my intervention. Those are the kind of issues that I'm interested in when I'm talking about the WHO. Maybe we can talk about some of those in, uh, in a bit. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Andrew. Uh, and um, you have some quite uh, uh, questions here on the questions and the answers, but um, we will continue with um, our last speaker uh, um, um, uh, today. Just a second. Yes, uh, our third speaker uh, today is uh, uh, Mary uh, uh, Passett. Uh, uh, Dr. Passett has 30 years of experience in public health um, and she's currently the director of uh, Francois Hafier uh, uh, Bagnan uh, Center uh, for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. And the rest of her introduction is um, on the screen and will uh, just save time and give the floor to uh, Mary. Uh, Mary will talk to us about the recent attack from the US administration on WHO. Uh, Mary, of please ask me. WHO, uh, Mary, uh, you have the floor. WHO, please ask me. Mary, you have the floor. मैं सबसे पहले सबको जनस्वास्थ्य अभियान के योगदान के लिए शुक्रिया बोलना चाहूँगी। Uh, this is a role of uh, uh, in its efforts to play. And uh, the People's Health Movement has been a really outspoken voice on the ways in which the context in which the WHO works has been undermined over the last years. So the initial title of my remarks, and I don't have slides, uh, was uh, Trump's attack on the World Health Organization. But the, and I, I want to talk a little bit about what Trump did. He's, um, he, he, he's an active guy. Uh, and, uh, but I also really want to put that in context and uh, make it clear to all of you who are listening to us uh, that the U.S. attack, not only on the World Health Organization, but on the whole U.N. systems extends back decades across multiple administrations, Democratic and Republican and have resulted in the pauperization of the uh, World Health Organization, which Andrew alluded to. And the, it's the WHO's efforts to, um, to secure its budget have resulted in many compromises that have uh, degraded its role as the world watchdog on, uh, for health issues. Uh, so I, I want to end with uh, with talking about the ways in which this absolutely historic uh, pandemic, this is uh, a, a once in a century event that we're all living through now, uh, I hope will offer us an opportunity to rethink many things about the way in which society is structured and the way in which uh, the WHO has come to be structured. So in mid-April, uh, Trump uh, announced that he uh, was going to freeze the U.S. contribution to the World Health Organization. And uh, he was quoted as saying that he was doing this uh, because of the um, bad behavior of the World Health Organization and, quote, severely mismanaging and covering up the spread. Hello? spread of the coronavirus and quote that would last 60 to 90 days during which time the U.S. was suspending its contributions. Now, uh, for those of us in the U.S., uh, it seemed that the, one of the main um, uh, things that had annoyed Mr. Trump uh, was that the World Health Organization Um, spoken positively about China's response to the, um, the, the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, so he, he didn't like that. Um, I just looked at the numbers uh, in, um, 
in the world and in the United States. As everyone knows now, the U.S. is the of the global pandemic. Um, it, in cases, uh, you'll remember that China leveled out at about uh, 80, 80, 80, between 80 and 90,000. Uh, and in the United States, uh, there have been 75,000 deaths. So this has been a very um, distressing situation for the United States and for Mr. Trump. Uh, so um, scapegoats have been sought and the World Health Organization is one. Now, the World Health Organization is very dependent on the U.S. contribution. The U.S. is the largest con single contributor to the WHO budget. Um, it contributes uh, somewhere between 400 and 500 million dollars a year, and it's uh, uh, to a budget uh, that Andrew has already mentioned is about 4.4 billion dollars. Uh, I was the health commissioner of New York City. A, uh, a city of 8.6 million people. And as health commissioner, I had a budget of $1.5 billion. So the city of New York for its uh, health department, which only comprised about 2% of the city's total budget, had a budget that's about the th a third of the size of the World Health Organization's budget for the whole world. So the WHO has been terribly underfunded uh, for years. And the Trump uh, administration in announcing this freeze not only um, uh, was following on its efforts to reduce funding to the WHO that had begun before the COVID outbreak had become uh, so apparent, uh, it follows on its efforts to reduce funding to the UN more generally. It gives about $10 billion a year to the UN, most of it for peacekeeping, the World Food Program, uh, refugees. Um, but uh, it also had withdrawn from the UNFPA, uh, the population fund at the UN because of issues around family planning. It had redrawn, redrawn from the UN's agency, I can't remember what it's called, that worked on Palestinian uh, refugees. Uh, it had reduced the WHO budget previously in 2018 by 20% and the UN AIDS budget by 30%. So this action of freezing the WHO uh, budget, uh, as astonishing as it is in the midst of a historic global pandemic, uh, was a piece of of years of reduction of funding to um, the World Health Organization um, that uh, Trump continued in his effort to have a go at uh, unilateralism. I mean, a, a promotion of unilateralism, a go at multilateralism. So the, this has meant for the World Health Organization um, that they have sought funding from other sources. I, I have never worked with the World Health Organization. My main uh, involvement with the WHO was during my some 20 years on the faculty um, at the uh, University of Zimbabwe, uh, where I got to learn a great deal from David Saunders, uh, 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 an icon of the People's Health Movement, uh, and also read the works of people like Anne Emanuel Byrne. Uh, but I have never worked directly with the World Health Organization. And it was known, say, from sort of its founding, which was at the end of the 1940s, um, into the 1970s as a technical agency that racked up these incredible uh, accomplishments like the eradication of smallpox. So it focused on communicable diseases. With the Ama'ata Declaration, uh, the World Health Organization stepped into a much broader view of what it means to be healthy, one in which it had been supported by many of the former colonies that were now newly independent. Its, F, its adoption of primary health care uh, was part of uh, envisioning of a new uh, economic order. Uh, and the United States um, responded by being increasingly uneasy about the uh, World Health Organization and beginning to reduce in the 1980s its contributions to the World Health Organization and the UN uh, more generally. Uh, the, um, the, that has led to a situation where WHO um, works with these things called PPPs, um, public-private 
um, uh, organizations and um, and takes uh, works with corporations. I think that the only products that they the the WHO won't accept are uh, tobacco companies and guns. Uh, so that means uh, alcohol, um, pharma, uh, which can play very negative roles. Are welcome partners now with the World Health Organization. And additionally, um, many uh, um, many uh, private sources of funding, in particular the Gates Foundation, have come to play an increasingly large role. Uh, so these are not governments; these are private organizations, and they earmark their money. Andrew alluded to this. The Director General only controls one out of every five dollars in the budget and the other money is all earmarked. So the amount of discretionary funding available to the Director General has, um, has been greatly reduced. The South Africans um, were the first people that I heard talk about the concept of capture, of state capture by private interests. Uh, and certainly in the United States now, we're seeing the effects of decades of privatization, of dismantling state protections, undoing regulation, uh, attacking unions, stripping workers of their rights, uh, failing to assure the basic, um, uh, basic needs of everyday life, including access to health care for uh, the world's richest countries. And this same phenomenon has reached into the WHO uh, depriving it of autonomy at the same time that it strives with the many, many wonderful people who work there to address this terrible pandemic. So I hope um, that as we all stand to defend uh, the World Health Organization and the critical and unique global role it plays, uh, that we also can be honest about the ways in which it has been undermined and the ways in which its autonomy needs to be restored uh, so that it can act in the interests of all people and fulfill its mission of ensuring the right to health. I know I'm, I, I think I'm usually not that American in speaking too fast, but I'm aware that we've all talked a little longer uh, than, um, than we initially thought we would. So to the interpreters, I apologize if it wasn't possible to keep up with me. Um, but that's where I want to end it, that the World Health Organization is a un unique and, um, and incredible uh, body, never perfect, uh, but now threatened, uh, threatened by the withdrawal of money and also threatened by a governance structure uh, that has emerged as a result of its pauperization. I tune in to watch the, um, the briefings by the World Health Organization uh, because in the United States, we have no such briefings except for this um, sideshow that uh, occurs at the White House. Our public health agency, the Centers for Disease Control, is not conducting daily briefings. And at the last briefing that is available online, um, the, uh, Dr. Tedros ended his remarks by saying that the antidote to COVID-19 is global solidarity. And those are the voices that we need to hear. And we need the WHO to be able to act in everybody's interests uh, without having to cater to the demands of its donors and to, um, uh, and to ensure that they remain independent voices that protect our health. With that, I'll turn it back to you, honey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary, um, for, for, for the great speech. Um, um, just to, uh, um, to suggest that we will go through the uh, uh, questions that have been uh, posted to uh, the speaker, but also I would like everybody to engage with what should we do? And what do you think people's health movement in particular uh, uh, can do and other uh, 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 social movements and health uh, uh, movements? Um, so we can end up with 
some kind of mandate for um, our global structures of people's health movement, but also to civil society uh, in large. To start with um, one question here, it's for Mirza. So how can we strategically support the WHO as an organization, but uh, also to keep it uh, uh, accountable? Should I go ahead already or should yes, we? Go please. <laughs> and this is, um, I, I think this is part, part of the exercise that I think uh, PHM uh, has been very much uh, involved in, which is, you know, we believe in the, in the, in the mandate of, of the organization, but we also know that there are many interests at play. So um, involving into or um, generating accountability nationally so trying to figure out government's positions, what is it that they are, you know, negotiating when they are negotiating resolutions or when they're negotiating um, text at the WHO, what is the government position? So from the national level, that's very important, the social movements, and that goes a little bit on the question that you just asked, honey. Um, I think social movements can really get involved in trying to, to find out their um, national government's positions on different health issues. Um, so that's one way. The other way as well is through the participation um, of the global meetings, asking questions, writing um, through the media, um, you know, uh, also pointing out what, when relations that are being set up at the WHO are actually hindering uh, the protection of public health or the right to health. And this is, I think, a very important role that's played of, of civil society in general, which is to be a watchdog to say when something that is being done, when it's something that is being engaged at the WHO is actually not protecting public health, it's actually not in the public health interest. And this is, and, and we have to speak because this is the organization, support the organization as well to, to respond. And I think in this case, uh, um, I've seen PHM do this in many of the, of the meetings when asked uh, uncomfortable questions to the WHO secretariat, um, and, the, and and this way I think is is kept in the record, but as well it kind of pushes uh, member states to have to respond and the secretariat to have to explain in many times. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mirza. And this is also uh, very linked to another question here uh, that was posted about. Um, are the procedures during the governing body meetings uh, um, in uh, are public uh, uh, records or not? And I'd say, yeah, they are public records. And added to what Mercer said, it's responsibility of civil society to take what countries are talking about and what did they say during these governing body and get it back to the country and expose the uh, uh, the governments in, in front and make the governments accountable. And here, just to add, the accountability of WHO needs to come from the governments, because if we talk to the secretariat, in many occasions, they are going to say we are member state organization. This means that the secretariat cannot take big decisions, which might not be very true. But uh, the idea here, if we want to keep it accountable, we have to start the advocacy at country level. We have to push our governments to play bigger role in supporting WHO and we have to see exactly what they are saying in these governing but our governments. Um, anybody, uh, Mary or Andrew, you wanna uh, uh, comment on that? Andrew? Uh, Andrew, you're muted. Um, yeah, I'll try and slow down a bit. Um, my apologies for talking too too quickly earlier. Um, these kind of topics make you excited, don't they? And it, it's really difficult to talk slowly um, about these kind of issues. Um, yeah, I. In terms of what to do about it, um, if it is the is the financing of the WHO. Um, I think there have been various um, suggestions put forward for what to do. Um, 
Larry Gostin's suggestion that we push to increase the assessed contributions by 50% um, seems like um, um, a good suggestion to me. I know politically it's, it's extremely difficult and different director generals have, have tried in the past to increase assessed contributions. But at the end of the day, if the world wants a World Health Organization that can coordinate a pandemic response, um, and we, if we want a multilateral organization that um, can bring all member states together, um, issue advice, generate and um, create norms and technical advice and all of these things, if, if we actually want that, and we recognize it as, as a global public good, which in my view it is, then we need to fund it properly. And so I agree with, with um, Hani that people, and I think, I think we are beginning to appreciate having experienced this pandemic directly, we are beginning to appreciate the World Health Organization in a way that we didn't before. And um, I mean, all credit to the World Health Organization's communications team and its social media presence. Um, I mean, it's, it's really put the United States on the, on the back foot in terms of the World Health Organization's messaging. And it's provided consistent advice, consistent public health advice. Um, when other member states are just flailing their arms around wildly. And I think people generally recognize that. So it's a great opportunity for the general public to put, Nash, to, to put pressure on their politicians at the national level to say, we want a World Health Organization and you'd better start funding it properly. Um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, there is um, another question, uh, Andrew, you may start with that. Um, a question saying, as I understand, the UN gives other UN health agencies, UNICEF and UNFPA, uh, funds from its pool, but not uh, WHO, and we three are competing together rather than cooperating. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, no. <laughs> no I, that's not my understanding. I think that under the Trump administration, uh, the the U.S. has 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 stopped giving money to UNFPA. Um, the uh, there was uh, so that's my understanding. I don't think that the that the U.S. is funneling money to UNFPA through another mechanism. Uh, other states have uh, stepped in to uh, to offset the withdrawal of U.S. funding to the UNFPA, as have other states stepped in to offset uh, the losses of um, uh, resulting to the Trump freeze. Uh, the uh, China citing uh, the the WHO's role as a multilateral organization added 30 million. None of the U.S. allies followed suit. Uh, even ones that have been critical of the Chinese uh, response to COVID. Uh, so the U.S. is alone in this, as the U.S. is in many ways. And if I could just say, I, I think it's difficult for all of us to get our heads around the magnitude of what's going on. The U.S. now has 33 million people who are unemployed. And this is off the charts compared to any other economic shock in, uh, in its history, uh, greater than the Great Depression. So there are going to have to be realignments that occur. Uh, the, there are hospitals in the United States that are laying off workers, cutting doctors' salaries in the midst of a pandemic. That's what happens when you have a profit-driven health sector. Um, and uh, so, um, so I, I think that they're going to have to be realignments. I have to believe that. And I, I agree with Andrew that, and, and Mirza that, that, that there's a unique role. Uh, you know, look at what's happened in the U.S. There are all these antibody tests. Nobody knows the, the, the quality assurance for them. And initially, the, the Federal Drug Administration said should be done by the companies. They'll tell you how good their test is. So these are the types of roles that the WHO has played, and, but they have to have the resources to play them. 
and we would have all been a lot better off if they could have done it. Sorry to rant, but um, there you go. We'll see how the question and answer is going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, another question here uh, related to uh, uh, the funding that uh, with uh, the cutting from uh, US, what are some strategies that uh, uh, available for WHO to, um, to continue working, to uh, uh, rely on other resources? How can WHO function with these cuts? What are some possible strategies? Hmm. Who wants to start with that? Um, so, like, shall I? Um, yeah, Andrew, go ahead. I mean, as as I mentioned in my intervention, it's let's not um, assume that it will happen. I mean, uh, Congress decides what um, what happens with the um, with the money, um, and the money from the United States goes to the WHO through uh, between 10 and 20 separate organizations. I believe that's the case, Mary, isn't it? Um, uh, and each of them. I, I, I don't know. I, I know, um, I'm not sure. Um, so so you, you're probably are, better. Are all of those organizations going to just cut ties to the World Health Organization? It seems quite unlikely to me. And this, this is a comment that was made by Charles Clift from Chatham House, and he's mm. quite skeptical about the the possibility of um, the you know, of of the Trump administration freezing freezing its money, um, and it's it's a risky strategy for the United States as well, um, mm. and it could find itself being um, you know threatened with losing its vote at the United Nations, um, and I, I don't really think that that the United States wants to do that. I think this is just an attempt to put pressure on the United Nations and introduce some reforms. Um, and it's done this in the, in the past, and I think it's trying to do that now. If you look at um, if you look at Trump's um, complaints against the World Health Organization, some of it is it, well, it suggests to me at least that that Trump does want to have a WHO, and it does he does want to have the international health regulations. And he does want it to be able to hold other member states to account, uh, presumably China. Um, so I'm not entirely convinced that it's going to happen. Um, at the moment, the United States owes $200 million uh, in assessed contributions. Um, so that's a sizable amount of money. But if um, every other member state, so the other 193, each contributed an extra $1 million, then that would cover the shortfall. <laughs> or, um, so, um, I mean, I, that's probably, you know, pie in the sky thinking, um, but otherwise the, the, the WHO would have to think about what it was going to do with that shortfall. And it has had to face a shortfall of 300 million, um, less than a decade ago it did have to lay off staff it laid off 300 staff and it did have to cut its budget um and as as a consequence some of the key um some some units had to be closed and as we saw including one that was directly working on pandemic preparedness um, so it could do that it would have to cut budget it would have to kind of rearrange its funding but hopefully it won't it won't come to that. And I, I agree yeah, with you, Andrew, that I, I think we don't actually know how much money has stopped going to WHO. Um, so part of this was related to domestic matters in the United States, which uh, as I've uh, noted, you know, our, the case count continues to go up, the uh, number of deaths continue to rise and, and uh, there was a need to sort of offer some explanations to, as to why uh, things ha were going, what some would say, pretty badly. Uh, so I, I, I agree that it seems unlikely to me that the US would effectively formally withdraw from the World Health Organization. That would be very extreme. 
it would be opposed by its own Centers for Disease Control, uh, I, would, uh, I would add. And if I may come in, I think we also have to remember that the U.S. also benefits from the participation at the WHO. So withdrawing would also mean giving away some of that sub power that, that uses all the time and that favors their interests. So, yeah. And Mirza, for, for, for you, uh, um, here in the comments also, uh, Dr. Bill Gesson talking about uh, importance of increasing the assessed contributions from your experience as South Center and watching the WHO, do you think that there is a space for that to try to increase the assessed contributions from other member states to protect the unity and the uh, um, the space of WHO? Well, I think, I mean, Andrew already um, touched on, uh, on this a little bit. I think the, that there has been attempts um, to, to do this. And I think the last one, I, I can't remember the year, but I think it was like three or four years ago. And they, I think, agree on a 3% increase if I don't if I remember correctly and yet a lot of um, especially developed countries um, they they particularly like to be able to do their voluntary contributions which means they direct the money to whatever programs and parts of the WHO they like unfortunately I think as well is that in general a trend that we've seen is that UN institutions are being pushed towards the private sector to kind of do fundraising strategies there because I think a lot of uh, member states are not, they don't want to give more money. And to some degree as well, it's a, it's a great way in which they can exercise control, right? Which is what we we're just talking about in the example of the United States. If I don't give you money or if I make sure that you have very limited resources, then I also make sure that you only work in the areas that I'm interested that you work in and that you don't step into areas that might be controversial or might touch um, commercial interests from your own countries, etc. So I think that is is I remember in fact that I think at some point there was a good coalition of of um, uh, civil society organizations and and a lot of people trying to say no no we we should increase and and if I remember correctly as well even David Leger from THM had done this analysis showing that they could even shift from voluntary to just move it towards core so that it will provide more flexibility to WHO to, to then decide where to put funding so that they were in a position what happened during Ebola, which was now their department had been you know, cut from funding. They, they didn't have flexibility to move funding around. Um, and yet that was also something countries weren't really willing to do. And um, I'm not entirely sure what is the solution for this, but it is clear that, that this is part of the problem. And, and also like kind of the solution of no, no, then go and find money through fundraising strategies. I, I find it problematic too, because in, in the end it's the responsibility of the states to make sure that, that this organization works. Yeah, uh, back to you, uh, um, Andrew. Uh, when, when we talk about the uh, role of WHO um, as a, a member state organizations, in the case of pandemic, what can and what can't WHO uh, do if member states are not allowing WHO to investigate pandemics and uh, uh, they depend on member states to uh, report? How can we solve this conflict? Um, well, I, I, I guess the WHO would invite um, each of its member states to read the international health regulations, um, which they which they have all um, signed up to, um, and which they um, are all trying to defend, but at the same time um, violate, <laughs> um, because there are some very clear guidelines there about the responsibilities of member states in terms of reporting, um, and there is clear clear guidance for the World Health Organization regarding what it can and can't do in terms of um, asking for uh, verification, um, using alternative sources of information. Um, if it hears on the grapevine that something's going down in China or the United States or, or, or any other member state. Um, and um, 
and there's a clear process uh, as to when the WHO can uh, reveal to the rest of the world exactly what's going on. Um, so it's it's there. Um, it's it's entirely there, and and member states can either choose to honour their commitments through the regulations or not. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, there is a question for uh, uh, Mary um, about what do you think health workers and NGOs can build an advocacy and solidarity with WHO at national uh, level. So, uh, if we talk about the context of the US, what civil society and health activists can do to counter the, the, the decision, counterpart the decision of uh, administration? Are there uh, any so the, Yeah, no, thanks. That's a really important question. And it, it, it also speaks to the fact that um, civil society is, is relatively weak in the United States. And, most of the movement around health has been aimed at extending healthcare coverage uh, to, um, to the millions of people who lack health insurance, the growing numbers. And so uh, there hasn't really been a constituency for supporting the World Health Organization, but there have been public letters which many academics and, um, and others have signed uh, protesting against the um, the decision of, um, of Mr. Trump to freeze payments while he investigates uh, the WHO's failure to um, report accurately on what was going on in China. Uh, so that kind of, that, that's been an, an action. Uh, as Andrew mentions, the budget in the United States is not unilaterally determined by the president. So everybody who, um, who uh, has a political representative here can tell them that they want to see the U.S. continue uh, its um, support in the uh, in the budget to the to global health generally because the U.S. has been in um, under in this administration has wanted to cut its global health contribution and to the World Health Organization in particular, which gets a fairly fairly minor share of the U.S. global assistance for health. So it's advocacy, calling your representatives. I, I don't know right now of any an, any other movement to um, that that exists in the United States. I've signed petitions, in other words. Thank you, Mary. Um, uh, another question here about the uh, the actions uh, uh, during the COVID nineteen uh, uh, time. Um, actions in different places that were not the same so especially in the lockdown um, so every uh, uh, country or even places in different countries took different strategies to implement what would be the role of who to push for more unified more coordinated action at a, a, a global level and whether or not who has the power to do that It doesn't. It doesn't have the power to do that. Um, it does have. Um, I mean, it's it's not a case of it having the power to do that or not. Um, um, there is a there's the WHO over the, the life of the organisation has developed um, customary practice um, in its relations with its member states and and and, and what it does is is issue guidance. Um, and the guidance is, ha, has been very consistent. So test, test, test um, from, from Tedros. Um, and it, um, it um, attempts to be as diplomatic as it possibly can. Um, and, and that is as far as it would go. Thank you very much, uh, um, Andrew. Uh, before getting back to uh, what PHM uh, uh, can do, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's a question to uh, think of it uh, after that. Uh, Mayor and Andrew, you thought that uh, the USA will not withdraw from uh, 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 WHO, but I think there is a kind of legitimacy dance right now. Who is going to delish to my the other? Will the U.S. administration legitimize WHO 
or WHO, which with other member states are going to legitimize the uh, uh, power of, uh, uh, of USA. And we've seen that in other things, like US administration in many occasions during governing body of WHO kept talking about non-political decisions, and this is specialized organization talking about WHO and in other UN. But when it comes to something like in UNESCO, the US administration cut the funding when UNESCO accepted the membership of uh, Palestine. Also, uh, uh, this happened to UNRWA. Just to uh, be found out that UNRWA is a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. And they cut uh, uh, the fund completely. And for those organizations to be able to delegitimize funding from the US, they worked a lot on fundraising and they spent a lot of time on funding rather than doing what should they do. So at the end, Mary, who's gonna delegitimize the other? Where is the power dynamic here? Well, you know, I'm not a political scientist, so I'm a public health physician, uh, but it seems to me that, um, as I alluded to, the, the, the U.S., um, you know, is confronting a changing political landscape uh, across the world uh, in which uh, new actors have increasing um, capacity to guide global organizations. And if the U.S. wants to isolate itself, and it will lose a great deal. As Mirza pointed out, the, there is a need for these global forums. So I, I think that the hope is that somehow uh, the uh, WHO and other UN organizations will be brought to heel. But if you take the case of UNESCO, you know the um, I think that uh, the Trump withdrew formally from UNESCO in 2017, if I recall. Um, but I thought uh, that they'd withdrawn know. years before, like in the yeah. mid 1980s. Uh, and of course, the trouble with UNESCO began in the mid 1970s when Jean Kirkpatrick, who I'm old enough to remember, an uh, academic gone, um, you know, uh, who turned into a right wing politician and represented the US at the UN, uh, set her sights on UNESCO. But yet, these organizations continue to exist. And in, both, in that case, it was all, all along over the question of Palestine. And so, um, you know, Israel left UNESCO formally, the US left UNESCO formally. It hobbles or, these organizations, but they do continue to do their best to meet their, their, their mandates. And I, you know, I suspect that the US will be increasingly isolated. As I mentioned, the allies didn't follow suit. Uh, Boris Johnson didn't say he was walking away from WHO or nobody joined this investigation um, with, uh, with the US. It's a solo act. Um, so that makes me think that wiser voices will prevail and the US will understand that it's not usually a good idea to just be out there on your own, isolated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mirza, um, last question here. Uh, does uh, WHO have enough mandate um, to be able to act against uh, pandemics? It is, its constitution allows it to do that effectively? Well, its main role is to do international coordination. So I don't think it needs any new mandate. Um, I think it is more a question of how that response is shaped and what does it mean um, effectively both at the you know at the front in terms of humanitarian response particularly for countries that have weak uh, health infrastructures but it also means in terms of policies right like if we think right now uh, one of the big issues that has not been addressed is how when we do have an, a vaccine, how are we going to ensure that everyone everywhere can get it? Knowing, as we know today, the limitations we have for manufacturing, 
knowing as we know today the competition that has happened between countries on buying protective equipment and masks and um, other um, inputs for tests, etc. So I think that um, it is a complicated question in the sense that the mandate exists, but countries have to work together to figure out what the response will be and how that mechanisms will be. And unless there is this willingness to do this international cooperation and trying to come up with, with solutions that would actually benefit everyone. Um, I, I find, not to say that WHO cannot, you know, has to sit there and then not do anything. They should still, I think, make proposals and still try to, 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 to think about mechanisms that could work. But then there is the other part about countries wanting to actually cooperate and come up with solutions that would actually address uh, some of these issues. Thank you very much, uh, Mercy. So, uh, for, for, for each of you, uh, in, in few seconds, what PHM should do? What do you think? Any, anyone, any, anyone who wants to start? Well, I, I can start since I was speaking. Um, well, I think that PHM has one huge advantage, which is this mobilization and this ability to tap onto expertise across the world. You have the, you know, the circles, you have the expertise from academics, you have people uh, from, you know, grassroots organizations. And I think this, this power of mobilization um, can really um, draw on this expertise to think about advocacy strategies uh, from the national level, the regional, and then the international. And I think this communication as well of, of from the grassroots to the policy processes at the global level is very important. And that is something that I think um, uh, PHM can do, can, can, can really uh, utilize that strength. Thank you very much. Andrew? Um, I think PHM just has to keep providing a critical voice. Um, not just to the World Health Organization, but to global health in general, um, to continue to um, push um, and introduce and keep the torch burning for um, um, a, a social um, medicine, which is grounded in human rights, equity, justice, um, and just keep that message alive because um, it's such an important message and so few organizations and, move, uh, and movements are doing it. So I, I hope it will continue to send that message loud and clear. Thank you very much, Mary. Sure, so I, I can only echo what both Mirza and Andrew have said, that the People's Health Movement has been a, um, a, a singular and critically important voice in the idea that it's the conditions of people's lives that enable them to be healthy and not simply the availability of, of drugs and equipment and supplies. And keeping alive the declaration of Ama'ata, which to my mind has guided my working life uh, for the last, well now for over 40 years, and which we can't lose sight of. And we have the People's Health Movement to thank for making it clear that uh, we need to have a, a society that's organized to support the well-being of people, that people need decent jobs, they need to have decent housing, access to water, uh, all of these things that are technically outside of the health sector. Uh, that's such an important voice. And to hold up the importance of the World Health Organization while pointing out the vulnerabilities that it's acquired as it enters into these agreements with uh, private entities that have, you know, that have no public control and the importance of civil society in advancing health. Thank you very much. Keep it up. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I think this was a, a great uh, event. Uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, end it up now. It's been um, more than uh, one uh, hour and a half. Uh, but I would like to, to say that this was a very fruitful uh, cooperation between People's Health Movement and the uh, Tricontinental Institute for uh, Social uh, Research. And we hope that this will happen again um, and again. Um, I would like to thank the management of both uh, organizations. It's been a, a great work to have. Uh, uh, at some point, we had more than um, 240 participants mm -hmm. here. 
So I think this is a great uh, uh, success. And we ended with 163 after one hour and a half. I think this yeah. also well, a very well, good. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you great, all. Great and thank uh, you, Hani, and all uh, organizers. Uh, and your uh, home assistant. <laughs> yeah, to, to thank the, our, our three speakers and the, the organizers um, and interpreters. And the, I, I know that it's not an easy function uh, to do it uh, uh, without face-to-face, -face, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, setting and also without um, PowerPoint. So uh, thank you very much. And I would like to thank all our participants for making time to join us and to post these important uh, uh, questions. So um, please, if there are any other questions, if there are any suggest suggestions for future events, please don't hesitate to write to our global secretariat, uh, um, to uh, Dr. Sander, and uh, we will try as much as possible to uh, meet uh, any suggestions. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll close uh, uh, at this uh, uh, end. Thank you very much. Hi.